And I am now going to pass the microphone to board member Margaret Barrier, who will say a few words about Aurora and introduce today's speaker. Hello. Um, I, uh, at, one of the things that we frequently do when we uh, start uh, a talk is have a little uh, speech by one of the board members, and this is my turn to speak. And I am the chairman for the um, awards committee. So I often, this is my favorite job because I get to um, look for people who deserve awards and present them to them uh, with the help of my committee. So I just wanna give a little plug. We do this every year for rock art people. Um, some of the awards don't require you to be uh, an Arara member, others do, but we have um, the Wellman and Bach Awards, which are for lifetime achievement. We have a conservation and, and preservation award that um, is for conservation and preservation. We have the Oliver Award, which is for photography uh, use in uh, for rock art. And we have an education award for educational programs. Uh, tonight's speaker, Dave Lee, um, received the Castleton Award in 2008. The Castleton Award is for um, a, a uh, excellent report uh, that has not been funded or um, supported by other groups. Uh, it can be a professional or um, an avocational uh, rock art person. It can be a film, um, a, uh, docu a documentary or a paper, and it can't be, have ever been published before. And um, so uh, Dave did his report on um, one of his uh, Australian adventures. So I'm not gonna say a whole lot about Dave because he told me not to. He said that he was gonna be tooting his own horn, but I will say that I had the privilege of uh, traveling to Australia and um, helping Dave once. It was a, a once in a lifetime experience. I also, because of that, I helped arrange for Dave to uh, be a speaker at the AIA lecture series. And um, they, flew him around the United States to give talks and people really loved it. And so they did that for several years. Um, so I'm gonna let you just take it away, Dave. Um, thanks so much. Before I get started, I would very much like to thank Aurora and um, all of the members who have uh, inspired me and helped me throughout the years, going way back to the very beginning when I first became a member, um, Frank and AJ Bach, Dan McCarthy, Ken and Diane, Margliff, Steve Frears, uh, Lee Merrimore, the list goes on and on and on and on. But I'd also like to thank Linnea for some help that she gave us, some very important help that she gave us this year on a management issue. And uh, everybody else that's helped me, I have to keep moving here. I would also very much like to thank the Owens Valley Paiute and the Wardaman people of Northern Australia for all that I've learned from them and for all the time that I've spent um, camping and learning on their countries. And I would like to thank all of you for joining me with this and for your interest in this. So I feel compelled to um, make a couple points before I get started on my talk and the first one is, and forgive me if this, um, every Aurora member probably knows all these, but I'm saying this for other members of the public that might be out there. There is a huge difference between a fact and an opinion. And I would just like to say that uh, tonight, like most speakers uh, that you've ever seen of rock art, I will be giving, uh, pre represent, presenting some facts and I will be pre presenting some of my um, interpretations of those facts and I'll be presenting my opinions on those interpretations. And it's really up to you to, if you're interested in it, to use critical thinking to figure it all out and not just um, agree with it because it sounds good or not agree with it because you don't like what I'm saying. You, it makes much more sense. If it's an educational thing, you need to put some, invest some time in it. Um, otherwise you're just being entertained. So, 
Another point I'd like to make is that it feels like I've been studying this for a very long time, but the only fact, uh, the most important fact that I've learned in all this time is that I've only barely scratched the surface. And as more facts will arise, I'm sure that the interpretations will change and hopefully the opinions will as well. And to go along with that, I'd like to say that everything that I'm gonna to say tonight is a vast oversimplification. And in my opinion, every rock art talk you've ever seen and every rock art book you've ever read has the same problem. We're trying to simplify something that is much more complex than you can present in an hour or in one book. So that concludes my lecture and now I will begin my talk. Like many of you, I fell in love with being out on country way before I fell in love with rock art or became obsessed with studying the cultures who made it. And wandering around out in the canyons and on the ridges, the, I remember the first time that I ever came across rock art out in the desert, um, it seemed to me almost like it, was, like it belonged there, like it was an integral part of the landscape. Um, it didn't stand out like a sore thumb, like uh, a lot of other um, intrusions of our, of our culture. And so in 1981, I was very, very lucky to get to move up to the Owens Valley, which is a very arid, big valley in between two mountain ranges. And it's usually pretty dry, but if we get just a little bit of normal rain or better than normal rain, which doesn't seem to happen much anymore. It really turns into kind of a Garden of Eden, which was the way it was during a lot of the time that earlier people lived here. It also has a tremendous amount of rock art and um, it's produced in a, several different fashions. It's mostly petroglyphs. There aren't that many pictographs up here, but there are some. And although it looks quite a bit different, nearly all of it is, um, falls under the heading of what we call now the Western Archaic Tradition. It used to be called Great Basin Abstract. Um, the word abstract comes with an awful lot of baggage and Western Archaic Tradition that Ken Hedges came up with seems to make much more sense. Um, in spite of the fact that it looks a lot different, it's all, it all falls under that umbrella. In 1985, I took a job at the top of the White Mountains and met my future wife, Charlotte, that many of you knew and were friends with. And we happened to be there during those years where Dr. Bob Bettinger was running his field classes, um, investigating the highest known village sites in North America. And that just sucked us right in and, and totally focused us on learning more about these earlier peoples. In um, 1995, 10 years later, we took a job, took jobs as stewards of the Granite Mountains Reserve in the Mojave Desert. And we're introduced to a whole new series of ecosystems and wonderful places to wander around. And sure enough, we ran into an awful lot of rock art down there as well. Both pictographs and petroglyphs. which looked an awful lot like the stuff that we have up here in the Owens Valley, uh, 250, 300 miles away. And during that time, we also met um, someone who inspired us the same way he's inspired hundreds of other people, Don Christensen, who began documenting and studying rock art in the 80s. And became our fearless leader uh, through a big project to record all the rock art in the Granite Mountains. And we joined his project with he and his um, colleague, Jerry Dickey, to continue recording their project of recording rock art in the Mojave Desert. But he's most famous for the work that he and Jerry and Rick Burry and a bunch of other people did in the Southwest. And in my opinion, this is one of the best books on rock art in North America. And if it's not in your library, it really should be.
It's based on 25 years worth of research there and documentation. So after working together mostly as volunteers for 10 years, in 2006, some of us decided to form a nonprofit called Western Rock Art Research, so that primarily so that we could apply for what limited funding there was to help offset the expenses that we were incurring from documentation. And I'm sure most of you already know this, but documentation involves a lot more than just taking photographs. And the research designs that Don Christensen had come up with involved questions that required uh, not only uh, element, relatively accurate element counts, but also recording all the other physical and cultural contexts because at its heart, the questions that he was trying to ask were, had a lot to do with what else were people doing at these sites besides making rock art. And obviously the corollary to that is how did the rock art fit into the lives of the people that made it, which to my mind is a much more intriguing and important and relevant question than what does that element mean? So for the next 15 years, a small band of us, that's the biggest group we ever got together for any one job, recorded, have been documenting rock art and doing surveys and mitigation work. And we're pretty sold on doing drawings. We mostly only work with petroglyphs. As we all know, recording petro, uh, pictographs is a whole other deal all over the world because of John Harmon's de-stretch. But the petroglyphs that we work with are sometimes very, very faint. And photography doesn't quite often catch everything. And it's my opinion, once again, that even on petroglyphs that are relatively um, visible like these here, that an awful lot of more details come out when you do a drawing of everything, an accurate scale drawing of everything. These also work very, very good in the field for when you're sending site monitors back in to um, check things out. And in addition to all the Western archaic that we were recording, we've also done some work in addition to the work that Don and Jerry did in the Grand Canyon, uh, quite a bit of work around the St. George area and found out that although these were supposed to be so-called figurative styles, they had quite a bit of non-figurative elements mixed in with them. And our most recent large project was uh, a project that we did with a group from Santa Fe, New Mexico to reevaluate, record or re-record. They had done a really good job of drawing a lot of it. All of the known rock art in Zion and came up with the 42 sites, 109 panels, all this. And we found out that although the archeologists there and pretty much everybody working on the project thought it would be almost 100% figurative, we found that of everything, it was actually 45% or thereabouts non-figurative or what we would consider non-figurative. And that goes along with what we've learned from crunching the numbers in the Western archaic tradition in the Eastern Mojave and the Owens Valley with around about 40,000 elements, we found that over 95%, like 97, 98% are what we would call, we would put in the category of non-figurative. So when I finally started getting into reading books about world rock art, it kind of struck me as really odd that in places like, for instance, South Africa here, that's well known for the big panels of Anthros doing all kinds of crazy things, including hunting um, scenes that on two big sites, for instance, here, 3,600 engravings, there were only 20 human figures and that quite a bit of the rest were ovals and circles containing grids. Um, where have I seen those before? So in addition to the work that Don and Jerry and Rick Burry and everybody else did in the Grand Canyon, these are the other areas where we've recorded sites, including the ones in Northern Australia down there. And we did not do drawings at those sites or we would still be there working on the first site probably.
even before we started crunching numbers, we noticed that these mistaken assumptions that are in the public mind and actually in an awful lot of published papers that everybody seems to think that it's normal depictions of people doing everyday things, a lot of hunting, hunting magic, depiction of game animals. It's only along game trails. It doesn't happen at habitation sites. So therefore it's only made by men. All of these assumptions going back um, and a lot of them have been uh, disproven as well, but these are all assumptions and they don't jive with the data out at the sites. Especially when they're trying to use this, these ideas or assumptions to pigeonhole um, rock art into particular theories that are uh, universal type theories where someone says it's all about hunting or it's all about whatever it is. So Great Basin rock art is, for those who don't know it, it's predominantly wavy lines, circles, dot patterns and all different combinations. And most of us who are working in this field believe that at least some of it was being made fairly recently, right up into contact times and perhaps even past that. But what we do know, um, because of the work of Cannon and Ricks, great work that Cannon and Ricks did up in South Central Oregon, is that at least a version, a uh, substyle or style of this Western archaic tradition goes back at least 7,000 years because there are panels of it that the bottom of the panel goes down below an ash level that was laid down around about 7,000 years ago. This is also the Western archaic tradition covers the most geographical ground of any rock art style in North America. I believe it goes into the, quite a bit into the Sonoran Desert, excuse me, as well. And tendrils of it, fingers of it, go up into more better watered regions, Southwest and um, other places, but it, it's centered in the Mojave and the Great Basin and perhaps the Sonoran. There are, even in places where there aren't a lot of depictions of sheep, which there are a lot of them, they're, they're not very common, uh, or they're not particularly common. They're not a big part of the percentage. There are footprints or tracks, animal footprints or tracks that again are not that common, but they do occur. So if this is what arid lands rock art looks like in North America, what does it look like on the other side of the planet? You be the judge. To my eye, this looks uh, statistically pretty doggone similar to the stuff I've been recording for a very long time. These are sites down around Alice Springs in Australia. And while there are things that do occur in there that don't occur here and vice versa, in general, they're utilizing a lot of the same ubiquitous designs. And if I found this site between here and St. George on Red Rock, I would just go record it and I wouldn't bat an eye. There's no way I would think that this was Australian rather than ours. Um, there is a, a large number of the sites there have an awful lot of tracks and prints, bird tracks, roof prints, um, and others, but, and that's a big portion of some of this type of rock art, which used to be called panoramity style in Australia. I'm not sure what it's called now. There are, however, a lot of other sites, including some big sites like this one, that there are either no prints or tracks or very, very few of them. Very much like sites here. There's, um, in, in my opinion, we haven't verified this, but there seems to be a greater site to site difference between two sites right down the road over here than there appears to be in, in the big body of these type of elements on two sides of the world. Even the pictographs in a lot of places there, and I'm only dealing with some of the desert, someone like Ben Gunn could give examples to refute what I'm saying or back it up from a lot of other places in Australia. And I'm only using well-known examples here, but in, 
quite a few places in Australia, there are certainly more than any place else on earth, there are um, traditional owners with unbroken cultural ties that still use these images to tell stories about ancestral creation beings and their exploits and travels back during what was called the dream time, but it's a complex um, belief that includes what's going on today and what's going on into the future. But there are still people using panels like these that we would call non-figurative to tell stories about very figurative um, ideas like you know, people moving through the landscape or beings moving through the landscape. And we met a man at Lawless Rockhole who said that his father, an elder who was, his uh, father-in-law, an elder who was, could speak for this site here, said that the way to look at it was like these were depictions of the world, but the world, the country as it was also during the dream time, and that this is only half of the map, that the other half of the map was inside the elder's head in the form of the stories and the songs that he knew about that landscape. And again, this gentleman said that that's the way that we should look at those panels. So here is a recreation of a, what they call a humpy, a little house in um, what we call a wiki up around here in Australia that was made by a family, an Aboriginal family for tourists uh, down south of Alice Springs and a selection of the kind of tools that would be used by people that are utilizing the resources in the desert. And this is the recreation of a wiki up sort of a shelter that was done by those great folks down at the Rock Art Foundation in West Texas. Again, showing the same kind of tools that would be used to harvest and, and process foods. And, by no means am I the first person. There's no new anything in my talk here. It was Australians long ago who first noticed these similarities. And I'm very happy to say that right now there are researchers in the University of Western Australia that are using our data from the Owens Valley in some of the first um, comparison, global comparison studies of arid lands rock art. Very interesting, interested to find out what they learn. To my knowledge, Robert Bidnerick was the first or one of the first people to notice these big similarities between the desert rock art of the Owens Valley in here. I mean, between the Great Basin in here, excuse me. And between the Great Basin and Australia, excuse me. In um, 2005, Aurora member Jeff Lefebvre invited Aurora member Amy Leska and Charlotte and I to go see the rock art in Australia. And uh, it was an amazing trip of a lifetime. And we completely lucked out in being able to meet one of the elders over there who had been raised in his ancestors shelters where they had painted and engraved and done ceremonies and told stories. And he lived and was raised mostly traditionally until into his 20s. And after meeting us, he asked us if we'd be interested in helping him record all of everything he wanted to say about a bunch of these different sites. His knowledge has been um, understood to be very strong and and full for his country going back as far as the 70s, as you can see in this quote. We were also fortunate because we went back for 10 field seasons to get to see him interact and talk about his stories and his country with um, <clears throat> elders from surrounding neighboring language groups, including the gentleman that was shown there. And so what we did is we recorded the sites just like we would here without doing drawings, mapping and measuring and photographing. And then he would come back and give us a long story describing what he thought was the most important story or stories of the sites and then go panel by panel telling us what he thought of the images on all the panels. 
Sometimes we did this when he was bringing other people. We re revisited some of the big sites multiple times over the years, and occasionally with younger people or people he was bringing there uh, in order to teach and to imbue with particular um, values. So his idea was that there would be a report for each of these sites that would include everything, basically everything he had to say about particular panels and that they would be available for future Wardeman to use and for future researchers to use after he was gone. And what started out is what we thought would be maybe two years, maybe three, we could afford to do this project because of help from friends and um, a whole lot of support, we were able to stretch it into 10 field seasons of two to three month periods. A Little bit about Australia for folks that don't know much about it. It is almost exactly the same size as the continental US with one really big notable exception. It's pretty empty once you get out of the big cities. And so there's a lot of country to explore. Some of the reasons why I think it makes sense to compare Australia and this portion of the new world, uh, here's the, the main list, I think, why these two places should be compared as opposed to say Europe or Africa or Asia. It was modern homo sapiens that migrated to both places. They'd apparently developed all these systems earlier. They repeatedly adapted to an awful lot and they still kept basically the same lifestyles over a long period of time, much longer in Australia, in the Australian case, 50, 60,000 years and 15 to 20, 25,000 here, depending on who you talk to. Uh, I believe that an awful lot of these things I'm talking about are global similarities, but I'm just sticking to those two because that's what I know a little bit about. Like I said, I'm just scratching the surface. One of those that I've seen in a bit of in both places are vulviform. I think once we crunch the numbers, we'll see that uh, they're actually one of the most common figurative images that we see in the Great Basin and the Mojave. Um, they're not really all that restricted. They do show up occasionally in sites all over the place. And some like these sites, there's big, big large panels of them, usually in the softer materials, um, but not, all, not always, the softer rock. Statistically, at least in the Owens Valley, they seem to be associated with cupules and with grinding slicks and with the use of pigment, but they occur in many, many different contexts. Female, gendered female anthropomorphs are very, very rare, rare, however, in these areas. And I think you don't find very many of them in the Southwest and in other parts of North America either, but they're certainly very rare, although they do occur. They're very rare in the Mojave Desert and the Great Basin. That's not the same in Australia as I understand it, that there are some places where actually the vast majority of the gendered anthropomorphs are female, but you also see an awful lot in the photos I've seen in the places that I've gone. Um, sometimes there are quite a bit of these images and Bill Harney and other women Wardeman elders have said that where these boulders are are where women's business took place at, a si at sites and where older women passed on knowledge to younger women or girls. Cupules are something else that happens worldwide, but here are some examples from Australia. And this is a vertical wall covered with cupules. in the Kimberley. They also occur uh, worked into the rock art in the same way you see over here, worked into the petroglyphs panels. 
and they occur in an awful lot of places that you wouldn't think would be conducive to just preparing foods or pigment or something like that. Here in North America, at least, we, I believe, still believe that um, the pit and groove style is one of the oldest styles of rock art in North America. Although the making of cups seems to have continued throughout um, all the different time periods and right up into fairly recent times, there is quite a bit of evidence or some evidence, ethnographic evidence here in the American West for producing it, including some evidence, ethnographic evidence right here in the Owens Valley. which I don't have time to give you today, but it had to do with uh, fertility and having children in this case. That panel there was actually by Ford Independence where that um, ethnogra ethnography comes from. We also, like I said before, see an awful lot of these cupules worked into or a part of rock art panels. And I personally don't get the joke uh, of is this a, uh, functional cupule or is this a spiritual cupule? Because it, it seems to me that the traditional people I know that all aspects of food procurement and preparation have spiritual components. So seems like there's an awful lot of overlap there and including in ceremonial life. So like I said, I just don't get the joke. Another thing that occurs all over are rock features. And well, there are rock features that we believe are, um, we have a, a function that we can figure out. For the most part, the vast majority of the rock features that we record that we believe are Native American rock art features, we don't know what they were used for. And there do seem to be a large number of them that were created and or used for other ceremonies afterwards down along like the Amargosa River, Green Valley, Death Valley, Pinto Basin, places that four or 5,000 years ago had quite a bit more water and there was probably a, a, apparently quite a bit more use of those areas. So you go to Australia where all the proper rock art researchers have very long beards or at least all the male ones do. And you see an awful lot of the same kind of rock features. And they're still scratching their heads over an awful lot of what the possible functions might be for them there. But there is a little bit of ethnography here. And again, I'm only scratching the surface. There are a lot of other people that have a lot better examples of this than I do. But in Arnhem Land, we were told that traditional owners have said that this site is the, shows the beginning of a man's coming of age ceremony that the end of the ceremony took place at another similar site many kilometers away. And the elders that I have interacted with have for the most part said that rocks that were moved or standing or placed somewhere were done back in the dream time or by ancestral beings. And in fact, uh, Bill Harney uses that to try to admonish younger people that you shouldn't move rocks around or cut down trees or do things to the environment that you don't have a really good reason for doing that because it was put there just like that back in the dream time. I'm gonna make another point here and we're switching gears to anthropomorphs. There are, Australia is very well known for an awful lot of very big, sometimes very supernatural looking anthropomorphs in some cases, like this one, they might be depictions of ordinary humans, like these are supposed to be. Uh, I believe they're supposed to be policemen. But there are a lot of other places still existing where the traditional owners or nearby groups of people still use them to help tell stories, cre predominantly creation stories, and believe that these figures help to illustrate those stories. Sometimes they're very elongated, they have different appendages, all kinds of things to uh, show that they're not just depicting a normal human being. And do we have things like that here in America? Well, 
all of you who have Don Christensen's book about the Grand Canyon would know that we do. These are in the so-called explanade style in the Grand Canyon, North Rim of the Grand Canyon. It's pretty obvious they were meant to be anthropomorphs of some type, at least many of them were, but they're definitely uh, consciously making them look very inhuman or superhuman as well. These are in West Texas, another place where it's, it's thought to be a figurative style, and yet there's an awful lot of things in there. I don't know what the percentage is of elements that we can only define or, or put in a category of non-figurative. Sometimes they make out to be plants or birds or spears or something like that, but quite often uh, researchers don't know what they are meant to represent. They are depicted with animals, although not to my knowledge much in the uh, attitudes of hunting. Utah, uh, as I'm sure all of you know, Utah has some of the most amazing rock art in North America. And a lot of it includes these big anthros or all different kinds of anthros, small, large. A lot of them that sure don't look like just ordinary human beings and not doing ordinary things, not building houses, not you know, so in procession or something like that. And now this is a um, opinion of mine that these were not ever meant to represent just human beings, that they're part of a much more complicated story than that. This is all probably very uh, elementary to a lot of folks, maybe not so much to others. This is up in Wyoming, Wind River area. And there are attendant animal figures, but also an awful lot of anthropomorphic figures that don't look all that human. When we were in Wyoming all those years ago, we were told by Wind River Shoshone that this panel, they thought, um, helped to tell the story of a, one of their ancestral beings named Weeping Woman or Crying Woman and the exploits, the adventures that she had during a, what could be called a creation time. This is stepping out of my lane and going a little bit into the agricultural side, but Again, in the Southwest in New Mexico, we were told that the traditional owners had said that these can represent ancestral beings, but also modern or contemporary dancers dressed up and emulating or within a ceremony becoming those beings and recreating events that happened during their lifetime. So I don't know much about other world rock art. Other Aurora members certainly do. And um, see what you think, comparing it to everything that you've seen in other parts of the world and with rock art that was produced by hunter-gatherers or forager peoples. And finally, we get to Wardaman country, the place that I know just a little bit about what I'm talking about, not a lot. Again, just scratching the surface here. And Wardaman country is at the very top of end of Australia there. On the peninsula, peninsula that houses Kakadu National Park and Arnhem Land between the Kimberley and Cape York Peninsula. This panel is used today by Bill and others to tell stories about the Lightning Brothers, to tell stories about other ancestral beings, bird beings called the peewees, and also by creation beings, gray falcon and, and brown falcon. These are known as the baby lightnings. It's the famous baby lightning panel. At the bottom are all these baby lightnings and above their um, instructors, their teachers. 
And that's one of the stories about this panel, but there are other more restricted stories that have to do with men's or women's business than I was not told them and I was just made aware that they're there. And so they were not shared with me because I, I'm not an initiated man. That was the same for many of these other panels that uh, we were told only the stories that were appropriate for mixed audiences of uninitiated people and that there were many other levels of knowledge that they couldn't pass on. Not every, not all Aboriginal people, but the Wardaman, traditional Wardaman people and certain other groups believe that some of these images were never originally painted by human beings, but they are the, like the shadows, the images of those beings that they put into the wall and put their spirit into the country and they changed into the birds and animals that are in Australia now their spirits still inhabit the country and they still inform and help and give power to people into the country. So we were told that these type of panels don't illustrate hunting scenes or the animals that people ate. They're not depictions of a larder. They're tools that were used to help tell stories, to help illustrate stories that for the most part had to do with the way birds and animals and, and other beings interacted during the dream time, had conflicts, resolved them, came up with sets of laws that they passed down to people and ways of taking care of the land that they passed on to people and that people still have to do ceremonies to care for that country to keep it whole and, and working properly. So here's just a couple few examples of what Bill was taught when he was younger. This is a famous panel of possum. This is possum dreaming. And they never did eat a whole lot of possums. They're not a great big food source. If they caught them, they ate them. But the stories that Bill, the story that Bill tells mostly at this site has to do with possum and the fellow on the bottom here, Bandicoot, and how at that very first ceremony back in the dream time, they each had a song that they could put together and it, together it made the first food for people to eat at that first dream time before there were any other um, foods available. And today they call that food bandalyan. It's this uh, scale that uh, I believe it's the way ants raise or herd aphids who then produce this a very sweet sort of like a bush candy that uh, a lot of birds and animals and and people like to eat children it's a like a bush candy like i said and even the animals here's white cockatoo scraping that scale off the back of the leaves for food Also, elements that seem very small and unassuming can be used to tell the very important parts of these stories, as well as natural features are incorporated into the stories as well. And whether or not it's what the artists intended, sometimes the juxtaposition of paintings and engravings can uh, steer the stories in particular ways, and sometimes they don't at all. And particularly the way that we recorded with Bill. It was uh, just back and forth to different panels after he told the, the main story, what he called the long story. This is a place that, Warda, that Wardaman children, Bill and other Wardaman children of his age were taken to and sat down and taught specific um, laws, the special laws that they were supposed to live by. And these are, as Bill has said, the women's laws, a symbol for women's laws men's laws and the laws that we all have to live by. So at other sites where you see, where Bill would see one or more of these symbols, it was an indicator to him and it informed, helped to inform him that a particular other law like a woman's law, murdu law or other men's laws were important to some of the stories or important to that site. This particular element shows up just one of them at five different sites, I believe. 
And Bill was told that whenever you see this type of a figure, it means that um, sign language is an important part of some of the stories to do with that site. And in that part of Australia, if someone talks to you and you don't understand what they have to say, you hold up three fingers and it tells them that you need to switch to sign language to understand each other. Bill is adamant that these are not tool sharpening grooves. There's a whole much more involved stories that I don't have time for tonight to tell you what they mean. But at these particular boulders, very large and gray boulders, Bill, uh, his elders used them to tell Bill how to take care of a person's body when it dies and how to do other funerary rites. And he uses these boulders to tell, to pass on that, that information. So we keep giving lip service to the fact that these were complex um, cultures, but I don't think we, most of us really understand what, how complex that is. At one point, Bill asked us if we would videotape him naming all of the springs around their, their station out on country. And in two or three hours, we sat down and with a charcoal stick, he drew on a piece of cardboard, uh, almost a hundred spring sites and named them, said how you walk from one to the other, gave a bunch of information about what dreamings and what beings are associated with it. And um, again, that's a, nearly a hundred in a couple of hours. After that, uh, this is a, uh, the upper part of Australia here. Darwin and Catherine are the only real population centers anywhere around there. A lot more crocs and cows and in kangaroos than there are people. Um, this is the Wardman country is about a hundred uh, miles in diameter. And in a very, very long day, Bill gave us, uh, told us all of the different boundary sites around each of the existing Wardman clan estates. And then the next day, a very long day, we, he came back and he gave us all of the interior sites and tied them back to the outer sites. Um, if somebody isn't isn't uh, muted, could they please mute? Thank you. So it came up with Bill came up with over 250 sites during two long days, mapped them out on all a bunch of maps inside of a building, and um, he said that he couldn't come up with a whole lot more if he was out on country, being able to walk across the country. Symbolic meanings of very simple elements. Quite a few Australian researchers have done ethnographic work that shows over and over that very simple designs like a straight line or a circle can be used to, do, to tell um, in a story as a symbol for a lot of different things. And they were told over and over, and we were told this too, <coughs> excuse me, that these are just some of the non-restricted uses for meanings for these type of designs and that there are many different levels of restricted meanings that they can't tell us about. And there's this quote from this very famous Australian researcher here. Kathy Burke, would you please mute yourself? Thank you. So perhaps the most famous uh, or most well-cited work is this work by um, Nancy Munn. And she found that uh, the same symbols could be used in different ways at different times for different things that were sometimes very separate, but sometimes they also overlapped. And you really needed to be an informed member of that society to understand when, what was appropriate there. Do we have any of that kind of information here in North America? Well, turns out that we do. And some of our members have actually written a number of papers and a number of books about that, but I'm just gonna present a couple of examples. Here is an example of a woman, a Native American woman who was allowed to stay on her ancestral lands when most of her people were either moved away or removed. She and her cousin were allowed to stay there 
And in later life, she was asked by a researcher what she thought of these various pictographs, red pictographs in her country. And here's just one example of that. And can everyone read on the right there, I hope, what she had to say? It was a very complex answer for just a zigzag line and three little slashes. Here is another example from Northeastern North America. And it looks just like a bird, maybe a stylized bird. Well, we do have some, a little bit of ethnography there as well. And this sounds pretty familiar. So we modern people don't really, it seems like a lot of people don't really have much of a clue or odd ideas of what hunter gatherers were. We use that term or we talk about them and usually just in a, as a way to make a joke sometimes. It can be funny, sometimes not. But the truth of the matter is, and we forget this, is that of all of our human homo sapien ancestors, at best, um, none of us have more than 200 to 300 generations of ancestors who were not hunter-gatherer, forager type peoples, but every single person on earth has at least six to 10,000 generations of Homo sapien ancestors who were much less other hominid ancestors. So um, we should keep in mind that an awful lot of human evolution took place, our, our, our cultural evolution took place actually um, before. And I can't get into it now, but it seems to me through physical anthropology right now, there's quite a bit of evidence that people were speaking and probably storytelling, this is my opinion, before we have any evidence of them being image makers. And I would put forward that the stories were being told before we were making images to go with them. And what we do know is that values such as these were invented way before um, the later cultures came along, that these are pretty basic um, values amongst indigenous people, if not universal, but pretty global. And um, they also share certain other values. And there's great big uh, conferences going on global conferences right now where they're talking about that quite a bit. So when people ask me, what do you think the rock art is all about? What does it mean? And they need this sound bite, a quick sound bite. The sort of standard answer I have is that I believe that this means that right here at this spot, some information was being passed on, perhaps through song, through perhaps through story, maybe or maybe not with ceremonies, but the the meaning, the reason behind passing on that information mostly had to do with how to get along with each other. That the stories of the conflicts also lead to being making resolutions, getting along, finding ways to get along and coming up with the laws that they pass down to the humans. That those creation beings pass down to the humans. And that it seems to me that an inordinate number of those stories have to do with that. So, Without um, speaking for any traditional custodians, I would say that what I have gotten from all of the uh, direct quotes that I've heard from traditional custodians about their rock art is that they're talking about that it's about a specific place on the land, a particular part of the country that they call home, and that humans have always been, or for a very, very long time, we have been using song and story and sometimes in conjunction with ceremonies to find ways to tie people to the specific group of people, specific individuals to a specific place in the landscape 
that they are connected to and take care of. That's a big part of it is the so-called um, caring for country, maintenance. So the question that I get by friends who are not rock art people, perhaps you get this question too, is why bother? And for me, the answer is that I believe that we still, our culture, our dominant culture still has a lot that we can learn from our earlier ancestors who developed ways to get along with each other and developed ways to take care of each other and take care of their uh, respective homelands. And again, we give a lot of lip service to these are complex people, but sometimes we really forget that as individuals, their lives were a part of their people's existence in a way, in a meaningful way, um, and the people who loved them, their lives were every bit as meaningful and important to humanity, if you will, as any of our lives. And we really could perhaps do a better job of what we do by adopting some of their better attitudes and ways of looking at the world, if you will. And I'll even say, because I am particularly enamored of Australia, that the last that I heard, they still have not found any archeological evidence for any large scale warfare in Australia. And of course there are conflicts. Um, in my opinion, cultures were developed to um, put a damper on testosterone, if you will, and develop ways for people to get along even when they didn't want to. And I think that Australia by developing literally one dreaming, one song line across the entire country, one story that com is comprised of many, many different stories and many different songs and song lines that they found a way um, to get along with each other. So I hope that despite all this, you know, stretching an analogy type thing, that you understand that every language group has its own many, many unique ways of looking at the world around them. But there are a number of things that seem to be found worldwide. They're not universal, but indigenous cultures across in every continent have follow some of these beliefs. And so my question to you, and the, much, the list is much longer than this, um, my question tonight would be if such general beliefs were worldwide at the time of European, the European expansion, isn't it likely that at least some of them extend back in time as well? These are very uh, conservative cultures that we're talking about. And along the same line, if the rock art is so similar, isn't it likely that in general, its functions and its reason for production are also probably pretty similar? Um, it would seem to me that that, again, it's my uh, interpretation of the evidence and so my opinion, but I'm leaving you with these three sound bites that um, no Aboriginal elder would have ever been okay with leaving sound bites, but here we go. Um, this is what our culture does. Even very simple symbols can have very complex meanings and multiple meanings that that information concerns literally all aspects of the traditional life of that culture, and that it takes literally an entire life to understand the, fully the stories that are behind those images. So wrapping up, I would like to throw in a little bit about management at the end right here and answer that question another way. When people ask me, why bother? Why do you do what you do? There's lots of other things that I could be doing with my life, but the answer to an awful lot of us and why we do this and a whole lot of you do this type of work is that a lot of it is being damaged and destroyed and not just vandalized, but loved to death. And we really need to get our handle on good management plans. And to do that, we have to have good base -like, baseline documentation to do it. So I would like to give another big round of thanks to people that I have been very, very fortunate to work with throughout my career in this business when the BLM and in the Forest Service, I've been so fortunate to work with some extremely hardworking, very committed people who put a lot of effort into trying to uh, protect and manage and conserve these resources, this cultural past that is really part of all of our past. 
the problem right now, especially if they've always had a hard time, but right now, in my opinion, they really need help. They're not getting nearly the help that they need. The archeologists that I work with, um, the help is not coming from above and there's not enough of it coming from below. And there are ways that individual people can help. If you really say you love, you really like rock art, you should be doing something about it. And many, many of you of our members are already doing something, but these are ways that you can do something uh, to make things better. For our part, we are going to continue to keep documenting at risk sites in places, especially where there just isn't any funding to do it anymore out here in the West. A lot of their attention, a lot of their money has gone to fire mitigation and a lot of other, uh, putting out a lot of other metaphorical fires, if you will. Um, a quick little update to finish up with is our work that we've been doing with uh, Bill Harney and the Wardeman. We finished up our field work. We did recorded a total of 160 sites, but we were able to get Bill to 49 of those sites and record everything he wanted to say about them. And that included uh, a total of over 120 hours of videotape, most of it having to do with a, the panel by panel recording of the sites, but also a lot of other stuff of um, a lot of other knowledge about trade and, and tool manufacture and all kinds of stuff. The end product, if you will, has been these reports that Bill always had in mind to be able to uh, collect all of his knowledge about each of these individual sites. And that uh, the word, of, that, anyway, we've I've finished up uh, 10 of these now. We've got 10 of them finished. Unfortunately, we got 20 more still to do just of transcribing and putting together these reports. So. If any of you know anybody who would be like to be part of this project or to help us continue working on it, we very much could use your help to go along with that. If anybody has any questions that I can't say, oh, before I finish up, these reports are being used right now by the Waterman people because they have been successful in turning a large amount of their land into an indigenous protected area, a both um, ecological and cultural uh, reserves. And the Waterman Rangers here are very happy to have these reports. It's like having Bill to take out to the different sites, in some cases, sites they haven't been to since they were children. Um, that's the end of it now. The, the top there is my email address. It should also be in the chat room. If anybody has any other questions that I can't answer tonight or um, wants to know where any of these sources or where else to go to, I'd be more than happy to um, answer any of your emails. And that's it for me. There we go. Did that work? It did. Thank you, David, for your okay. presentation. And I would encourage people to uh, please put your questions or comments into the chat. Um, David's presentation, I think, was uh, quite provocative. So um, it's, it's an opportunity for us to maybe have some discussions uh, back and forth about uh, you know, interpretations of rock art. Uh, I'll start off with a few and then uh, give people time to, to add some more things to the chat. Um, so one question would be, if you were to talk to two elders, let's say who didn't know each other, would you get similar interpretations or would each have sort of their own interpretation, um, you know, for the same uh, figures? The overall stories seem to be very, very similar across. And again, we're working with one language group, but these stories um, weave very well into the stories of elders with their neighbors. But it seems to me that the elders from different um, clans had their own take on an awful lot of the details of different things. And remember that uh, anybody, any teacher, changes things as they're telling stories, depending on what points they want to get across to their audience. Yeah, so it sounds, I mean, one takeaway that I guess I would have is that um, we're really talking about mnemonic devices. Um, and so with a mnemonic device, it can, you know, basically remind somebody that's been told what it means, they can be reminded of what it means. And also it would conceal what it means to people who, let's say, weren't initiated. So rather than being representational, which kind of gives away what it is, if you have it as a sort of a mnemonic device like that lightning wavy line, um, 
you're accomplishing two things, right? You're reminding people what it's about. So you're kind of keeping the story in their mind, but you're also preventing other people from knowing what it's about. Is that your feeling about uh, why they use so many of these, uh, what we call abstract uh, mechanisms to represent things? Well, it is. And uh, Ben Gunn, Ben or Lee could give you a much better uh, answer to that, but um, it's, uh, uh, in print quite a bit that elders in the Red Center and in other places have made a point of saying that the more non-figurative the designs, the more restricted the knowledge and hard for anyone to understand. And that quite often, the more figurative things are include uh, references to stories that are more open to more people. And again, in my opinion, again, it's just my opinion, I don't think it's fair to say so much that um, the pictures tell the story as much as the pictures are used or more or less pulled off during the course of telling the story to help illustrate places in the story that the that the storyteller is is reaching and that it's not a matter of walking down the wall and saying and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened um it would depend on where the person is sitting and again this is not the people who made the rock art it's generations later of these stories changing and evolving as they as they go along yeah so how does how do the um let's say these mnemonic devices or whatever that are on let's say a single panel are they a number of different stories that are intermingled or are they are things that are about the same story located clustered together or are they scattered about you know with stories intermingled um, on on the panel scattered about, uh, and that includes on different sites, different sites over a long distance quite often have different parts of the same story that they are involved with. And, um, and again, the only stuff that I was told was that that was accessible to everybody and that he felt he and other elders felt was all right to pass on to me. So, and I'm not so sure that the mnemonic devices is, is certainly at play there but I don't necessarily think that that's the overarching um, thing that's going on here. I think that uh, another thing to remember is that the rock art itself uh, to an awful lot of elders, when they visit a site and want to be telling the stories and passing on the knowledge, the rock art is not the first thing that they go to. It's the site itself. It's what everything that's around. It's, um, you know, their stories of their life that happened there and everything that the rock art is not the focus. Um, it's the, the ceremonies that took place and the, the dream lines that go through there. And the rock art is not incidental, but it's a, it's a side thing. Yeah, so everything's tied to the, uh, sort of the, the creation story that happened to wander through that particular spot. Or the pieces of several of them that pick up in that spot, yes. Right, so that spot could actually be the intersection of several different uh, paths, I guess you could say. I, I think in general, most of them could be defined that way. Mm. as I understand it. Yeah. Okay, so let me um, pick up a couple of comments. On, I'll just read them and then have you respond. Um, so let's see, let me start. Uh, okay, hold on, a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff has come in here. So let's start with this one. Okay, so here's a comment, Panoramity, um, which was named after a type site. Uh, may be called in the literature tracks and lines Correct. from John Clegg. Um, now, far too many regions and indigenous languages to supply a term to cover this pan -Ameri pan Australian tradition style. Uh, so that's a comment. I don't know whether you want to further comment on it. No, that all I, I, that makes sense. Ben Gunn would be the one to comment on that, and they know much more about it than I do. I do know that it's thought of as more of like a tradition with a whole lot of other regional styles, much like we probably have here once we get that much of it recorded. So are there people that's that elders that still interpret those other styles? Or are some of these styles sort of lost to us because we don't have anybody that uh, you know has sort of a continuous memory of them? Well, the, the continuous memory per se has been, you know, changed and adapted and no doubt what Bill Harney was passing on was just a tiny fraction of really what his elders knew, which is because of every, everything they were going through at the time. And that was likely a fraction of what the people before them knew. So, um, yeah, I think it's just, it's not easy to pigeonhole any of this. 
Yeah, I know sometimes uh, you have different keepers of different parts of a song line and they will kind of meet up <laughs> in yep. the, at the edges and exchange stories so they exchange knowledge with each other. Um, okay, so here's another comment. Um, as David is speaking, I realized that we all may be taking a heterosexist interpretive position on vulva forms and concentric circles. Um, and then see Robert Mais uh, Maplethorpe's self-portraits. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm not gonna bring Robert Mablethorpe into this talk. Um, yep, I don't really know what I could comment about that. I do believe that here in America, we don't give enough credence to the idea that many of the sites and many of the parts of the sites and possibly and probably much of the rock art was made by women. And in Australia, it's very, very clear with the Wardaman people that uh, there's a whole section of sites and parts of, of sites that are both men's and women's sites, that that's women's business. And we seem to not give that nearly enough um, airtime over here. Well, I mean, you probably couldn't see any of the women's business. So, I mean, you'd have to have a woman uh, working with some women elders, right, in order to capture that and maybe couldn't share it with men. Well, that's correct. And in the Wardaman's case, we were allowed to visit the women's sites and Bill was felt allowed to be able to tell us just the overall story that that women had told all everybody that was not um, something anything that was specifically for women but he absolutely would not tell anything about women's sites so there and there were also like i say site moon dreaming is a classic site that has one area that's the men's business and one area is at the women's business and men and women could visit both except when those ceremonies were going on when it was restricted but that's not the same always in a lot of other cases Traditionally, there are restrictions on men visiting women's sites or women visiting men's sites. Um, so here's a very uh, general question. How can we help without coming to Australia? Um, yeah, well, I won't be going back to Australia. We finished our, our field work, so we're just working at it now. Um, any donations to our nonprofit 501c3 nonprofit will be going directly into um, everything that we need to continue working on these books. So getting them done, your name will be included with everybody else that's acknowledged in helping get this project done. And, and um, these books don't, aren't something that you can get and it'll tell you what the rock art means. It, it will tell you how complicated the stories are behind the rock art and what this particular elder thought, which images were connected to what stories and how they told it. And in my opinion, that's very, very valuable. Like I say, we've got, I've got um, 10 of those books done and they're about, they fill up about this much of a bookshelf and there's 20 more to do. So I'm hoping to have a, a, a body of knowledge there that um, it all sort of fits together. One thing, the last few trips, we got to work with some other elders there with Bill and they were um, very open about how they felt that all of their stories and songs were felt together. They were, it was some elders actually were following the rain dreaming and the fire dreaming line through the uh, north, south across the country. They felt that their stories all fit together very well. And it was told to us that they felt that it all added up to just one story, just one song, just one uh, dreaming across the whole planet or the whole continent that was made up of all these different song lines and stories and, and songs. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you, so do you think like some of the Paleolithic art that we see in Europe is also essentially doing the same kind of thing, telling stories, maybe our points on dream lines and such? I don't know enough about paleo art. I mean, I'm as fascinated as any of us are, but um, there are certainly people who could comment on that much, much better. As a distant observer, I think that Again, I, I think that we will see going on with physical anthropology and other ways of learning, because there's a whole lot we can learn about rock art without what does that specific element mean. There's all kinds of things we can learn about human cognition and, and the way thoughts or people traveled and tons of things. In Australia, it's actually a real archaeological artifact, and they treat it that way over there. Um, not so much here. So I do think that storytelling came along before the image making, at, at least in terms of the physical evidence that we have for it now. Uh, so here's another question. In your experience, uh, has Bill repainted or added to 
any of the sites himself. Oh, yes. Um, that baby lightning panel was uh, partially repainted uh, in the 80s when um, Bill and his cousin Lily Gengina um, did some ceremonies with uh, children and taught them how to do some repainting there. It was never finished in part because Lily died in part because um, accessing the site during the times that they felt it needed to be done is extremely hard during the wet the roads are all closed and they no longer walk across the country like they used to so they do believe bill was told that um the way he related to us is that he and lily and other Waterman children of that generation were told to pick one site that needed to be what he called um upgraded and freshened uh before they died and pass on how to do that ceremony to children. So at least during that generation, that's the way that was done. But he was also very adamant that he himself never made individual elements. There is in a particular site where um, there's a white horse that he says his father painted and the name of that horse that his father had named that horse, his name, Idun Duma, and um, that it was a horse that he had painted. And there are a lot of other, again, other Australian researchers could do a much better job of explaining um, what other, other language groups have said about the rock art there. Hmm. Uh, okay, so here's another one. How did you get permission? Oh, okay, so in ancestral times, how did one get permission to do rock art? Um, you know, what if a kid wanted to try his art? his or her artistic side? Is it the case that only elders made the rock art stories? I have no answer for that. And uh, I don't think that anything that was going on with Bill necessarily answers that. But he did point out that women, that there were some elements that he thought really didn't subscribe to any story. And he thought that women had been showing younger women and children and other children how to use the pigment. And we only saw that in a couple of sites that had other paintings that he could explain, but we did see it several times at a woman's site where um, it was used by Lily and others to bring children there and they worked with, uh, cause there's lots of ochre around there and they did uh, made drawings and paintings on boulders in the wash that would then be washed off. So is this a continuing tradition or is it pretty much ending? Are there, are there still youngsters who are going through initiation and learning these stories in a traditional way? They are certainly learning the stories. I can't really speak about the initiations. That's something that they would prefer. Uh, it's restricted information that I, I'm not um, allowed to speak about, but they're certainly passing on a lot of this information. They're very keen to get the people back out on country. Um, certainly some of those ceremonies are still taking place. Um, tonight, I just can't get into a lot of the politics that have made the north end of Australia. Um, well, there's something called the intervention. Let's just set it, put it that way. Anybody can go Google that and find out what's going on. I'm not really going to get into it here. Yeah. So, what um, can you say anything about sort of the gathering habits around the rocks to tell stories? How how would how would that have happened? I really can't. No, okay. I really, you know, Bill, the only thing that Bill has said. He has talked about some of his initiations and um, and mentioned the places like I showed where children were gathered there and the elders um, both told stories and got the children up to repeat them and repeat the songs and dance the dances. And he talked about that quite often, how they would spend nights doing that and how they would go to particular places to do particular ceremonies. But um, well, I ne we never attended any of those type of ceremonies and I couldn't speak to it. Yeah, do you know if they still walk the song lines, so to speak, going from one site to the other, um, you know, sort of tracing the stories uh, through the geography? I know that Walpuri people recently did that in walking up through the center to the top end through um, and following these uh, water and, and fire song lines to the north. And that's, I believe, a bunch of that story is, is online right now. And it's a fascinating story. So there are definitely um, other groups of people who are doing that. And I, I believe that that's the hope, the Waterman people have the hope that they will get back to some of the uh, traditional uh, things that they did that they have has stopped in, in recent years.
Yeah, now you, okay, so here's a, a question about, you were trying to relate um, Great Basin abstract with some of the Waterman or various different kinds of Australian uh, rock art. Um, and someone is asking whether you might think that some of the Celtic uh, non-figural elements may also go back and somehow be related. I don't think any of that is related in, in the way that the people were talking to each other or they came from one place to the other. I think the ideas, I mean, the way the people moved is the way the folks moved. Clearly these symbols are linked to our, our mental faculties and our uh, imaginations and our mental imaging and all that. But I, um, I, I don't see any of that type of a connection that that these people ever were in in my way of looking at it uh because that we have recently i mean and not that many years ago we had that thing here where someone showed up from ireland saying that uh they had seen glyphs right down here the, the road here that were just like the ones in ireland so clearly irish people came over here and taught the native americans how to do rock art and i mean that's just racist come on um so i don't believe there was any people um that, that that type of of people what this is is fanning out from the very beginning is the way i look at it it's we're hardwired mm -hmm. okay so there's another question about gender specific sites but i think you answered that um that there were sites that were off limits to women and vice versa right so i think the answer to that one was yes um Let's see, did you say that rock art sites were chosen in part because of being on regular traveling paths? I can't speak to that in Australia, but it's very clear to me in the work that we've done in the Mojave and the Great Basin that that seems to be the bigger uh, common denominator rather than on game trails or um, you know uh, going off in the somewhere for shamanistic uh, vision quests or something like that, that a large number, particularly the large rock art sites, seem to be along travel corridors con connecting one area from another. Okay, a lot, a lot more comments coming in. So I'll just, ha I'll just read them off and let you comment on them. So in Australia, the so-called geometrics are arguably a general, let's see, general resemblance icon iconics as in the sand drawing tradition uh, documented by Nancy Munn, where a circle will stand for a hill, campsite, or a waterhole. Even if secrecy is being protected, the story will be utilizing general resemblances, resemblance iconicity to evoke the often reserved songline meanings referred to, uh, referring to secret sacred topographies. Would you like to comment on that? I don't think that I'm qualified to. Okay, that was coming in from uh, someone who also studied, I think, Australian art. So we'll... it sounds like someone that knows more about it than I do. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. Here's a comment about kids doing art. Think of Giotto di Bandone, who started as a kid trying to scratch the image of an animal on a rock and was picked up by a famous artist and taken to his studio. So I guess it might be a kind of similar thing where. Um, you know, artists were, or people with that skill were, um, you know, identified and then became uh, allowed, I guess, or taught to do this kind of work. That's certainly possible. I really don't think that uh, the theory that a lot of what we see might have just been doodling by children. I think that the, um, the uh, patterns that we see and the restrictions that we see. For instance, you know, in the Great Basin of the Mojave, there are particular areas where faces are, are seen, but, you know, here in the Owens Valley, 10,000 images, and there's three, maybe four examples of maybe somebody's face. And these people saw faces every day. So there were a, a lot of um, patterns, a lot of restrictions, a lot of taboos about what could or couldn't be um, an image couldn't be made of. So I really, it doesn't fly for me that um, unsupervised children were allowed to make any of the marks that we see today. Yeah, so you, you sort of hinted early on that um, there was some sort of original source of, of these that then spread out to the Americas, spread out to Australia. 
Um, do you think it was actually a sort of a continuous tradition or was it a matter of sort of that the, you get these global visual resemblances that could issue from similar life ways? I'm definitely not making the case that the image making as we see it here or we see it in Australia fanned out all the way across um, Africa and Europe and made it to those places that clearly there are big swaths of country that um, they do have some non-figurative designs, but not in the way we see it in the arid lands. I definitely think that it was um, the the mindset or the way of the world view of the of the way the world was formed, the way things were created, was perhaps part of that thing that fanned out from Africa. But as far as the image making right now, it seems to me that each of these different places developed in part because of that hardwiring that people have. Okay, so it's not as if the, you know, with a language that that language kind of traveled with them, it was that the, the idea of taking, uh, uh, making these images came out of the similar life ways in different spots. I think so. I think so. I don't see a, a trail of stuff coming across Siberia and down into, um, you know, Alaska and Canada and working its way down. It's uh, a lot of other stuff was going on. And remember that these people were making images in a lot of other, on a lot of other surfaces besides those that have still held up. Right. We're only seeing a fraction of what image making probably went on. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that, I think we've got through all the comments or quite a few. I think it's, it's a great talk and it really got a lot of people thinking. So with that, I would like to thank you again for your presentation. Thanks again to the attendees uh, for your interest. And I would say uh, if you'd like to learn more about Aurora, remember to check out our website, our Facebook pages, and remind you that our next event will be in January. So uh, please visit our website or Facebook page for more information on that. And until then, good evening, everybody, and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Great job. Thank you. Feel free to email me, anybody with questions.